So we've got a, a good group online tonight, and we've got a good group uh, uh, here in the room with us. So tonight we're we're going to plunge into First uh, John chapter two, and we're going to furiously go through two verses. Uh, I had I had wild aspirations of getting through verse six, but the more I got into uh, the first two verses, uh, I didn't want to give you ten pages of notes, and so. Uh, or take the time to go through 10 pages of notes. So we've got two pages of notes, uh, which those of you online can find on our uh, church website at uh, fbsweetwater.org uh, on under uh, Wednesday night, and you'll find the notes there. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Well, the first thing you notice here at the beginning of what we have is chapter 2, is the sincere affection that John shows to us. My little children little children he calls us john is probably very old when he writes this and he is probably the last of his generation what would it be like to be the last person on earth to have walked and talked with jesus um, and this is probably where john is at this point uh, and you know when you start getting older which my doctors always remind me of every time I see them, uh, the word young becomes more and more relative. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, we had one of our kids uh, stay with us, uh, Sam Lamb, who may be watching tonight, uh, Sam and his wife, Robin, and their two teenage boys live uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and so here is this grown man married with two teenagers, but Kathy and I still think of Sam and all of the kids from uh, those, those days as our kids. Uh, and so it, it, it set me back a little bit when one of our kids announced on Facebook that she was a grandmother. I needed to go lay down after that. Uh, but this is kind of how John is, it, it, you know, you, you may be 50 something years old, but when you're 90, you're a kid if you're 50, you know? And, and so John is, John is, is, is looking at, at all of those who are his children in the faith and, and who he loves so much. And so uh, here he is speaking uh, to this new generation of believers, and he he calls them his own children, and and so and so we are, and he says to them, "My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin." Well, like any good parent, John wants his children to be good and to not sin, um, but. Uh, he uses a, a verb tense here uh, that is, is even tighter than that. He's, he's saying, I, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin even once. Not that you just may not sin in general, but that you may not sin even once. Well, that, that sounds very difficult, right? It sounds, you know, almost like being in a straitjacket. You're walking uh, on a straight line, and if you step off, you're, you're doomed. But, but John, remember, is a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, and, and he was there that night when Christ was arrested. And like all of the rest of them, he ran away. He failed. So he is very well versed in the way of the disciple. 
He understands the ethical mandate from Christ. And so when he says, I'm writing to you so that you may not sin even once, he understands what he's asking. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you help people not sin even once? Well, one answer is we'll just lower the standard, right? You know, it's, it's like a track coach. You know, I, I'm going to make sure that all of you get over the bar on the high jump. So you lower the bar to eight inches. Most everybody's going to make it. Uh, and But that's not John's solution. How do you do it? How do you, how do you help people get over the bar? Not when the bar is set so low, but even when the bar is set high. And so the answer is never to lower the standard of morality and ethics that Christ requires so as to help people not sin, nor, nor is there just the simple sort of shrug, kind of taking from Romans, well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so what's the big deal? We're, we're all guilty, so, you know, there you go. Well, the big deal as we shall soon see further on, is the absolute solid lock between obedience to Christ and love. Obedience and love. If you love me, Jesus says in John 14, 15, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Um, I have always been a big kid. Um, I, was, I was born at just 32 weeks, and somewhere in these 16 boxes of loose photographs that my mom had is a picture of the nurse holding me, and my leg is only the size of the length of her thumb, and I don't think she had exceptionally large thumbs. Uh, I was tiny as a baby, but I was only tiny for about 30 minutes. Um, I have a December birthday, and so at four, um, I was head and shoulders bigger than any five-year-old and most six-year-olds, and my mom took me to meet the kindergarten, or the kindergarten teacher and said, should I hold Buddy back a year till he's five, he turns five in December, or should I let him go ahead and start? And the teacher said, Ms. Parrish, if, if you hold him back another year, he's going to not be able to get under the doorway when he comes in, so please go ahead and let him start. I was already over six feet tall by the time I was 12. And so when my mother, who was 5'2 and 105 pounds wringing wet, gave me a command, take out the trash, vacuum the living room, it wasn't out of fear that made me want to comply. Uh, I did it because well, I, I love my mom. No one likes to take out the trash, but if she says to take out the trash, okay. Um, and this is how it works with us in Christ. We, we don't do what he asks us to do because we're afraid that if we, if we step off the chalk line, he's going to send us straight to hell. We do what he asks us to do because we love him and he loves us. And in that love relationship, the last thing we want to do is disappoint the one who loves us, right? Uh, you know, every good football coach, basketball coach, track coach, every good teacher, mentor of, of young people who is successful is successful because those players, students, mentees love that teacher. Um, I, I have known um, kids who, as, as they say, would charge hell with a water pistol if that's what this teacher, this coach, this, this adult asked them to do. Not because charging hell with a water pistol is a good idea, but because the man I love, the woman I love, this, this adult who I love asked me to do it. 
And if they ask me to do it, I'll move heaven and earth to, to get it done. Uh, this is that relationship with Jesus. The, the absolute lock between our obedience to him out of the love that he has for us and we have for him. So while there is always that high ethical demand with, with Christ, with love, there's always grace, right? Grace. Um, you may be shocked to know that on more than one occasion in church, I was not good. And I remember one Sunday, I knew death was waiting the minute I got home. I it just, I mean, I, I, I could see the rage. I don't know what I did. I, I don't, I'm sure I didn't kill anyone, um, probably. Uh, but my mother was just in an absolute rage with me. She was so angry with me driving home from church. And, um, and I, I don't know what, what happened, um, but she reached into her, her closet and she got a belt. <clears throat> but it was one of those little cloth belts that women wear just decoratively around a dress. And when she popped me with it the first time, I looked at her like, I'm not dead. I'm still alive. And I'm not sure what that was, but it sure didn't hurt. And she looked at me and she's got this huge smile on my face and tears are just rolling, rolling down her face as she's smiling at me. And she hugs me and says, I love you. Please don't ever do that again. Okay. I love you too. I'm sorry. Don't sin. But if you do, there's grace. And without grace, the demand, don't sin, would be a weight that no one could carry. This was, this was one of the things that Jesus fussed at the Pharisees about. You put such a weight on people for all of these thousands of little sins that they can't possibly carry it because they had no grace. Without grace, the demand to not sin even once would be a weight that no one could carry. But without the demand, grace would be just, just pure sentiment, sentimentality. You know? I, I'm, I'm free to live however I want to because Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. So I've got my ticket punch to go to heaven and I'm good and I'm fine and I can just do whatever I want now. Isn't that great? No, it's not great. Because to do whatever you want, to sin however you want, means that you don't love him. Without the demand, grace would be nothing but sentimentality. And without grace, the demand would be a weight that no one could carry. Using that same verb tense, John goes on. And he says, if anyone sins, and, and really it, it means more than just that. If anyone sins at any point, we have an advocate with the Father. And that's, that's, that's a big that's good news, right? Because it means that when we sin, God does not abandon us. When we step off the chalk line, God does not abandon us. When, when we sin, God still loves us. God loves us even when we're not good. And again, going back to that Sunday after church with my mom, I, 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 I'm sure I must have done some horrible offense. I, I can't, I, I don't remember what I did. And, and that would be my defense in court. I, I don't remember. You know, um, but she still loved me, even though she was ready to send me back wherever she had got me from. She still, she still loved me. Um, I've, I've confessed my, my singularly biggest crime to you all before on a Sunday morning where I was about the same age and I was in the uh, seat of the shopping cart 
at the Mead and Williams grocery store of uh, North Gainesville, Florida. Um, and my mother was very uh, good friends with Mr. and Mrs. Williams. And Mrs. Williams was running the cash register there. And mom was emptying the, the basket, the cart. And so me, the child, I'm sitting there in the basket and, and you know what they put right there, right? They had this whole little display shelf right there, candy. I'm a three-year-old, four-year-old little boy and, and high-priced marketers in New York have packaged this candy just to make it appealing to me and it worked. And I knew from previous visits at the Mead and Williams grocery store of North Gainesville that if I asked my mother for the candy, the answer would be no. And I wanted the candy. I believe it was a Snickers bar, which is still my favorite. And you can understand now, right? Snickers. And so I took the candy and stuck it in my pocket. And I got home with it. And there, my crime was discovered. <gasps> I was a thief. It was almost as bad as that Sunday at that point. And the worst punishment was that I had to go back to the Mead and Williams grocery store of North Gainesville, Florida, return the partially eaten Snickers bar and apologize to Mrs. Williams. I would have rather have had the beating but even though I had committed a felony, my mother still loved me. And I think Miss Williams at least still liked me. And this is how God is with us. When we sin, God still loves us. That's what Romans says, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and he died for us why because god so loved the world the sinful rotten stinking foul world so much that he gave his only begotten son but more than that more than just that he loves us while we are sinning in his son that he has given us he has given us an advocate. He has given us our own lawyer. It's like if I had gotten back to the Mead and Williams grocery store of North Gainesville, Florida, Miss Williams would have brought in her own son to argue my case for me. That did not happen in, in reality, but that's what God does for us. He gives us his own son as an advocate. The word advocate here in, in verse one is translated from the Greek word parakletos, which literally means one who comes alongside. And yes, if you've heard that word, those of you who've been in Sunday school uh, and occasionally from a, a preacher wanting to show off his expertise in Greek, uh, this is the same word that is often translated as the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the parakletos. In the New Testament, this word can mean comforter. Uh, this is what Jesus is saying in, uh, in, in the upper room there in John's gospel. It can mean helper. You see that translated either way there where Jesus says it is good that I would go away because I will send the comforter to you, I will send the helper to you, I will send the paraclete, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And all of this is in reference to the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Here, it relates to the one who pleads a case in court on behalf of the accused, one who comes alongside of you, who helps you. My favorite image of this comes from the Barcelona Olympics, that was what, 1998, thereabouts, uh, where there is a British sprinter, young man, 
who was one of the favorites to win uh, the 440, I believe it was. And as he is coming down the home stretch, the last 100 yards, he's right there, and he's got a shot to win it. And his hamstring on the back of his thigh pops. I've never had that happen, but athletes who I've known have told me that that is the most painful thing they've ever experienced, more than a broken bone, more than anything else. When that hamstring pops, you stop running. And he just crumbled like a leaf in the middle of that track. And he's trying to get up. He has trained all of his life for this moment. He wants to finish. And his dad is there on the first row watching this. There's a YouTube video of this. You can go home tonight and, and look it up. Uh, and in a moment that is both beautiful and a little disappointing with the security measures at the Barcelona Olympics, his dad leaps over the wall, goes straight past the security people, straight past all the coaches on the outside of the track, gets out on the middle of the track and helps his son stand and puts his arm over his shoulder and his other arm around his waist and the two of them cross the finish line together. It is a perfect picture of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside of you, who picks you up when you cannot make it on your own to heaven and, and puts your arm around him and by his strength, he carries you to the finish line. It is, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And so this is who God has given us, this one who is willing to come alongside of us, to comfort us, to help us, to be our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So note two things here in verse one before we go on to verse two. When John says, if anyone sins, he is by default including himself as a part of anyone. Here, the beloved disciple, John, is identifying with us as we struggle. He, too, needs God's grace as much as you or I. He is inviting us to share God's grace with him. And, and I love that. Um, I, 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 I said way back, you, you all know that my third anniversary was this week. It's been three years since, since I came. Uh, where does the time go? But I remember being in this room and confessing that I don't like a lot of preachers. And, and, um, and there's good reasons for why. But the ones I do like are the ones who put all the pretense down and are willing to admit that they're just as weak and wounded as anybody else. Um, and this is what John is doing. The beloved disciple of, of Christ, the one that Jesus looked at from the cross and gave his mother to, is inviting me and you to share God's grace with him because he needs God's grace in his life as much as you or I do. The other thing goes a step further because God too is identifying with us when he is both our judge and at the same time our advocate. Second Corinthians 5.19 tells us that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate and, and, and God who is judge is in him identifying with us, standing with us, going that, sec that second mile that Jesus speaks of in the Sermon on the Mount. If anyone forces you one mile, go with them too. God goes further than just giving us his own son to be our advocate. He comes down off of the judge's seat and advocates for us with Christ, that is a, how much love, how much love, that is an amazing picture. 
So we get to verse 2. And speaking of Jesus, John says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Um, that's a word that I'm going to guess none of you have used in conversation today, propitiation. Um, it's, it's a word that has kind of gone out of, of usage in, in English. Um, and it's not just a, a Bible word, um, because it is used in other cultures elsewhere, so to speak. Uh, the, the Greek word for propitiation there is the word halasmas. Uh, it is a tough Greek word for us to understand in English, and it presents a, a picture that is somewhat foreign to us. We understand who an advocate is. We understand the picture of an attorney arguing our case. We, we get it. But the picture here with propitiation is a picture of sacrifice. And we, are just, we just don't, we don't do that. We don't practice that in American Western culture anymore. The image comes out of the Jewish tradition of sacrifice, where in order to be forgiven of sin, so that the relationship with God that sin has uh, disrupted may be restored. Now the Jews had a very, very intricate system of sacrifice to cover a very wide variety of sins. If you committed this sin, then you make this sacrifice. Uh, and failing that, because you may have missed a sin, or there may be some sin that you've done that's so unusual that uh, there's nothing really in, in the book that covers it. You have the Day of Atonement where sacrifices could be made just to cover all the sins, anything else that might have been missed during the year. So this is uh, propitiation. It is sacrificing for atonement of sin. Uh, and you, you, so you, you may sacrifice a dove, or you may sacrifice a lamb, you may sacrifice a whole bull, depending on whatever the sin is. And you say, well, you know, what's, what's the, you know, what did the dove do? Well, nothing. Uh, it, it's, you know, the animal is, is somewhat inconsequential. It's the value of the animal that's, that's important here. Um, and so there is a, a cost uh, to you in the sacrifice. If you, again, go back to uh, Abraham and Isaac, obviously there was going to be a cost uh, to Abraham, the cost of his only son, uh, for the propitiation of sin there, and God made a way around that uh, on that day. Um, the word halasmas and its uh, verb form, which is always fun to say, halaskestai, um, carries roughly three different meanings with it, depending on the context. Um, you, you understand context, right? Because English, uh, uh, Jane Booker, if she's watching, had something I think today on Facebook about uh, English and context. Um, if I just give you the word B-O-W, what does that mean? Well, it depends, right? Depends on the context. Um, you may climb in the B-O-W of a boat, but if you're going to try to use that to shoot a deer, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, you want the B-O-W that's a bow, right? Uh, and there's so many things in, in English uh, that are just like that. It's the same word. It's spelled exactly the same. It even sounds different, though, in some cases, uh, depending on the context. Well, that's the situation here with this word. So first, it's used when a man must pacify or placate someone who has been injured or offended. Uh, you, you have to, you have to uh, offer some propitiation for the injury or offense that you've committed. And the word was commonly used in pagan worship, uh, the idea commonly used in pagan worship for sacrifices to ease an angry God. The Greek gods were always mad about something. Um, uh, they were terribly offended uh, here and there constantly. And so you had to make a, a sacrifice or propitiation to placate the gods. Uh, but you may have to do it if, you, if you've accidentally uh, uh, 
you know, killed your neighbor's favorite sheep or something. And so you have to make a sacrifice of propitiation uh, to, to balance those scales. Um, so second then, the word can also mean to forgive. It flips, flips the word around a little bit. So in, in that context, the, the, the word is, is the action that God himself provides so that the relationship between God and, and his people may be restored. So there is an act of forgiveness, an act of propitiation on, on God's side where the relationship can be restored. But, but third, and I think this, this really may get more at the meaning here, uh, the word may also mean performing a deed whereby the taint of sin is removed. Um, taint is another word that's kind of passed out of our usage. We don't use that word much. But uh, if, um, if, if, you're a, if you're a young boy working on a farm and, and part of your job is to uh, clean out the, the stalls, or clean out around where the cows have been milked earlier, um, you've got a taint about you by the time you get in. Uh, you, your clothes are tainted, and uh, your mother can, can smell the taint on you from about 10 feet away. Uh, there's a taint about you. It's not just, it's not just uh, how, you, how you're stained, but also the odor about you. Uh, and so when we sin, there is a taint, there is a stain that comes with it. Uh, one interpreter has translated the word to say that, that uh, what, what God has done through Christ as our propitiation is that we have been disinfected, uh, uh, deloused, um, uh, again, we, that's not an issue that we have to deal with much in the world in which we live anymore. But once upon a time, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you had been on a train or if you had been on a long boat ride, uh, before you came into someone's home, uh, you might want to expect to be deloused with the lice that get on you as you are on the train or uh, uh, in a hotel somewhere. Uh, yes, yeah, some of you are kind of getting heebie-jeebie about it now. Uh, there was a poor couple I knew in, in, um, uh, in, when we were in Athens. They were a very fine couple, very well-to-do couple. Somehow, some way, they got lice in their house, and they just could not get it out. And, I mean, they, they, they did some of the most extreme things you ever heard. I, I suggested just canceling their insurance and burning the house down. That would be about the best suggestion I could give them, clothes and all. Um, but one translator has said, this is what this is like, to, to, to be deloused, to be disinfected, to get all the infection of sin off you, to get all of the, the, the lice off of you, to get all of the taint, the stain of sin off of you. So then, now that you're clean, you're able to again enter into God's presence. So in this sense, uh, another, and again, we don't use the word much, but in this sense, the Greek verb hiloskathai means not so much to propitiate, to appease an angry God, but to expiate. Uh, that Christ is the expiation for our sin, not so much to pacify an angry God, but to disinfect, to be cleansed, to be, to be made pure, to have the stain of sin removed from ourselves. If you go back to the last chapter, remember I said it was my favorite verse, 1 John 1, 9, Christ is faithful. If we confess our sins, right? He is faithful and just to disinfect us, delouse us, to cleanse us every day from the stain of sin. This is how it used to be done, right? Um, on the 11th, I'm doing a video presentation uh, of, of World War I to my daughter's 
history class. I've, in the past, uh, I, would, I would go to her class and I would bring all of the things that the grandfather figure of my life, my great uncle George brought back from France when he returned from World War I in 1919. Uh, he was part of the occupation force, so he stayed an extra year. Uh, I have his uniform, and I mean uniform singular. America was not a rich country in those days, and we didn't have any kind of army when, when we went to war. Luxembourg had a bigger army than we did. And so when our soldiers were training, and he was training at Camp Jackson, not Fort Jackson yet, in South Carolina, they were training with wooden guns. There was a wooden model of a machine gun that they would, they would train with, a wooden model of an M1 rifle that they would train with. They didn't have guns. And you had one uniform. You didn't have a summer uniform. You didn't have a winter uniform. You didn't have a white winter uniform or a sand-colored summer uniform. You had one uniform. It was green, and it is 100% wool, and it's lined on the inside. So in the winter time, you're generally going to be okay. But in summer, and they were, they were uh, going through basic training in, outside of Columbia, South Carolina in August, which has got to be one of the three hottest places in the world, in that wool uniform, one. And so if you're going to keep it clean, if you've got to go through inspection with some captain who's bored and looking for something to do, what have you got to do every day to that one uniform you've got? You got to clean it so that when your sergeant or your lieutenant decides that you're going to have a surprise inspection, if that uniform's not clean, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be on KP peeling potatoes until the end of the war, which may not be a bad deal, actually. This is what that image gets at. You've got one life. One spirit, and sin has stained it, and the only way to get it clean is to allow Christ to be the expiation, to be that one who cleanses you because he is faithful and just, and he loves you. So if you'll just confess your sin, yes, give it to me, and I will cleanse it every day. John concludes this thought at the end of verse 2 with the powerful statement that God through Christ has done this, not only for the Jews or even just for the Greeks who thought they were the smartest people in the world, but for the whole world. When you were with us back as we looked through Revelation, what we learned was is that the Roman world knew of China. They traded with China. They knew of India. They traded with India. They traded with Southern Africa. They knew of vast territories that went north of the Roman border in Europe and, and to the east of what we now know as, as Russia. They knew of all of these territories. They knew that the world was a big place, much bigger than just the Mediterranean. Salvation was for all of those people too, the whole world. Remember Thomas, made it all the way to India, where he was martyred for the cause of Christ there. Salvation was for the whole world. He himself is the propitiation, the expiation, the, the one who cleanses our sins, who disinfects us, who rids us of the disease of sin. And not for our life only, not for our sin only, but for those of the whole world. For God so loved the world, the whole wide world, that he gave his only begotten son. Have you got a, a bucket list of, of places to go um, that you know you may never get to go to, but it'd be fun to go if you could go? Um, I, I do, Korea, South Korea is not on that list, but I'm fascinated by hearing stories of the church there. Uh, I told the story once a year or so ago about a, an American businessman who was a Christian who uh, 
related the story back to his pastor when he got home of how his company sent him to Seoul, South Korea uh, on a business trip, and he stayed at a nice hotel. Uh, and when he went to bed that night, he was delighted with the hotel, and he left the window open, the door of the curtains open, because uh, he was going to have to be up early anyway. But he was awakened about 4 a.m. because all the lights from the soccer stadium across the street were on. And all the lights were shining right into his room, and it woke him up. And you can turn over if you want, but when those great big lights from that stadium are shining across the street into your bedroom, it's daylight, right? So finally, about 5 o'clock, he just went ahead and got up and got a shower and went downstairs to breakfast. And the fellow at the desk said, uh, good morning, sir. I hope you slept well. And he said, well, I slept fine until about 4 a.m. when your soccer team over there was uh, deciding it was time for practice. And the man said, I, I don't understand. And he said, the lights from the stadium woke me up at 4 a.m. And he said, oh, I am so sorry. But that's not the soccer team, sir, that's the church. They gather together at 4 a.m. every morning to pray before they go to work. And he came back and he told his pastor, he said, you know, if you had asked me before I left, is I, was I a good Christian? I would have said, well, of course I'm a good Christian. I'm as good a Christian as anybody I know. He said, but now I'm not so sure because their definition of what it means to follow Jesus and mine are not the same. So the whole world, South Korea, China, there are more Christians in China than any other country in the world now, more than the Communist Party in China which is part of why the Communist Party there is so nervous these days. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being with us tonight. I thank you for the truth of your word. How great your love for us. That if we confess our sins, you will cleanse us of all of our sins because you are faithful and just. You love us. How marvelous that when we do sin, we have an advocate, your own son, and you, you come too, both as our judge and our defense attorney, because you want us to be forgiven. You want us to be made clean. You want us to be with you in heaven forever and ever. How amazing, Lord, is your grace. We thank you. We know that we are not worthy of such grace, such love. But we thank you. And we love you and will live in such a way as to never disappoint you. And so, Father, thank you for loving us the way that you do, the amazing love. Thank you for loving the whole world. Be with us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>